Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the book of Daniel. Uh, first thing that we should go over is the time period. So the book of Daniel is said to be a record of time from 606 BC to 536 BC. We have a record from secular, uh, the secular calendar as well as our biblical, uh, biblical account. So we see in Daniel 1 verse 1, he was carried captive to Babylon in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, which was about 606 BC, until the first year of King Cyrus, which was also about 536 BC. Uh, if we move on through, let's talk a little bit about Jehoiakim. So Jehoiakim, and I'm going to zoom in this if I can. Oh, yeah, look at that. So Jehoiakim, who was king of Judah, we have a record of him, was one of the last kings of Judah before the Babylonian captivity. Jehoiakim was uh, a son of good king Josiah of Judah. His mother's name was Zebedah. Jehoiakim's father, King Josiah, had returned Judah to the Lord by tearing down idol shrines and restoring obedience to God's law. After Josiah's death, his son Jehoahaz was the chosen king by the people, but as so often happened in those days, Jehoahaz did not follow in the footsteps of his father, but did evil in the sight of the Lord. Jehoahaz only reigned three months before he was taken into captivity by the king of Egypt, who replaced Jehoahaz with his brother Eliakim. The Egyptian king renamed the 25-year-old Eliakim Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim also did evil in the sight of in the Lord's sight because of the ongoing unrepentant sin of the nation of Judah. God sent invading armies to capture and enslave them. Jehoiakim was taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar, who put him in chains and carted him off to Babylon. It was at this time that Daniel and his three friends were also taken to Babylon. Jehoiakim was later returned to Jerusalem, although he had to act as Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's servant for three years to pay tribute to tribute to him. I'm going to kind of shut it off there. One thing that I want to draw to mention is that we see that he was the king of Judah. Now, normally when we're reading in the Old Testament, we would see the king of Israel or the king over Jerusalem, something along those lines. But at this point in time, we see a split into two kingdoms. We have the northern kingdom, which consisted of Israel, had 19 kings. They reigned for 250 years through seven dynasties, and that led into the Assyrian captivity. And then the southern kingdom, which was Judah, which was 370 years uh, that was uh, oversaw by 20 kings with one dynasty, and that ceased to exist during the Babylonian captivity. So here we see, we break these down a little bit. Keep going. There we go. 370 years from Jehoram to the Babylonian ca captivity. And we see the split that transpired between Judah and the Northern Kingdom. You may ask me, well, why did they split? I'm going to take you down to 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to read. I'm going to read to the end of the highlighted portion here. But uh, Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, the Ephraimite of Zerida, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the Milo and repaired the damages to the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, met him on the way. And he had clothed himself with a new garment and the two were alone in the field. Then Elijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourselves 10 pieces for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of, the, out of, the hand of Solomon and will give you 10 tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Shemesh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in the eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments as did his father David. So if we look at this and we, we're, we're trying to scale back through time because we did Genesis 
we read through Exodus and then we kind of skipped around and went through first and second Samuel, you'll see that this split is happening uh, after that point, right? When we get into the Kings, some things that should be brought up about leading into the captivity. Daniel one, one instructs us that Daniel was carried away into captivity. It's called the Babylonian captivity are some notes that I got. I believe this is from BibleStudy.com. I normally put a tab on the bottom. This one's missing one. Um, after Solomon's death, his son Rehoboam was set to become the new king. Jeroboam returned to Egypt and led the people to confront Rehoboam uh, with a demand for a lighter, lighter tax burden. So these are those instances that led up to the split. When Rehoboam refused the demand, 10 of the, the tribes rejected Rehoboam and David's dynasty. And Ahijah's prophecy was fulfilled. Only Judah and Benjamin remained loyal to the king Rehoboam. The northern tribes crowned Jeroboam as their king. Rehoboam made plans to mount an assault on the rebel tribes, but the Lord prevented him from taking that action. Meanwhile, Jeroboam further consolidated his power by instituting a form of calf worship unique to his kingdom and declaring that pilgrimages to Jerusalem were unnecessary Thus, the people of the northern tribes would have no contact with the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. The northern kingdom is called Israel, or sometimes Ephraim, in scripture, and the southern kingdom is called Judah. From the divine viewpoint, the division was a judgment on not keeping God's commands, specifically the commands prohibiting idolatry. From a human viewpoint, the division was the result of of tribal discord and political unrest. The principle is that sin brings division. So we're about to start into Daniel. And generally speaking, what I do is I give you guys a breakdown on the subject character. Um, you know, when we talked about Paul, we talk, when we, when we talk about some of the various epistles, we went into describing Paul, some of the disciples, obviously we talked about Jesus um, and John, when we talk about Revelation, but one thing that I want to do different about this book is I want us to read through it and then almost make like a scorecard about Daniel. I don't want to give you guys my commentary or others commentaries leading up into this because you should be able to derive a certain commentary from reading it on your own. And they all should, in theory, align. I'm certain that we all have our... Uh, few various spots of uh, differences, but for the most part, they should align. So that's going to get us into chapter one. So in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure, I'm, part, I'm sorry, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and the three years of training for them, so that at the end of time that they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Um, one thing I want to note here is, when as we're reading the, the intro to chapter one, who's in charge? Do you guys see who's in charge here? Okay. Who? Ooh, ooh, I heard it. Who said it? King of Babylon. No. What did you say, Shelly? I said no. When you said, do you know who's in charge? Oh, said, okay. Yeah. I thought you said God. So one okay. one thing that I one thing I want to point out in the first verse, it says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. God's in control in this situation. God gave over. It wasn't any mighty power that Nebuchadnezzar had prior to this. It's something that God did. He allowed it. Okay. So God's in control. 
Now, even though Nebuchadnezzar may have been the ruler. So the question that you should be asking me or that you may be asking me is, who the heck is this Nebuchadnezzar guy? And what do we know about Babylon? Okay. So Nebuchadnezzar the second, also, and again, I pulled some of this data. This one's actually from a secular site. This is Britannica, which is interesting. I have quite a few, quite a, quite a bit of data to share about Nebuchadnezzar. But um, he's the second and greatest king of the Chaldean dynasty of Babylonia. He was known for his military might, the splendor of his capital, Babylon, and his important part in Jewish history. Nebuchadnezzar was the eldest son and successor of Nabopolassar, founder of the Chaldean Empire. He is known for the cuneiform in inscriptions, the Bible and latter Jewish sources, and classical authors. His name from the Akkadian Nabuchadnezzar means, O oh, Nabu, watch over my heir. So again, their god that they that they would worship at that time was Nabu is watch over my heir. Uh, while his father disclaimed royal descent, Nebuchadnezzar claimed the third millennium Akkadian ruler Narim Sin as ancestor. The third year of his birth is uncertain, but it is not likely to have been before 630 BC, BCE or BC. For according to tradition, Nebuchadnezzar began his military career as a young man, appearing as a military administrator by 610. He is first mentioned by his father as working as a laborer in the restorian of the temple of Marduk, the chief god of the city of Babylon and the national god of Babylonia. Um. Okay, <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to realize why I have a quote here from Jeremiah 52, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of backdrop on when we talk about King Nebuchadnezzar on how he dealt with things. He was uh, a vicious ruler, to say the least. And so I'm going to share something from Jeremiah that describes a little bit about the king. When he says something, he means it. He means business. So Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutual, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, till he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the 10th month and on the on the 10th month and on the 10th day of the month that Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it and they built a siege wall against it around the city so that the city was besieged until the 11th year of Zed king Zedekiah by the 4th month on the 9th day of the month the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land then the city wall was broken through and all the men of war fled and went out of the city at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were near the city wall all around. And they went by the way of the plain, but the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, and they overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath. And he pronounced judgment on him. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and he killed all the princes of Judah in Riblah. He also put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him in bronze fetters, took him to Babylon, and put him in prison until the day of his death. So I'm going to summarize this in a nutshell for you guys. King of Babylon was pissed. He decided to lay a wall of men all the way around the city to starve the individuals inside. He let the people go except for the sons and the priests. And then he put them in front of the king and killed his sons in front of him and then gouged his eyes out. So the last thing he would have ever seen was his sons being murdered and slaughtered. And that was the last image that he would see until the day of his death as he was in chains in prison. That's a pretty gruesome response, right? Would you guys would you guys agree to that? Yeah. Yeah, it's ghastly, right? So people didn't mess around with King Nebuchadnezzar. A little bit more about Babylon is you can and it's unfortunate that you can't see this, Shelley, but Babylon was a monstrous city. 
it had these insane walls and these gates that were all over it. And the, the walls and the expanses on top of the gates on top of the walls were wide enough to where a chariot could turn around on top of it. Um, we see, and I have, I, I'm going to share some data with you guys. It says, uh, Nebuchadnezzar built three walls around Babylon at heights of 40 feet and so broad at the top that chariots could race around them. The Ishtar gate in the wall of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon was claimed by some to be greater than any of the listed wonders in the ancient world. The Greek historian Herodotus named that Babylon surpasses in wonder any city in the known world and specifically praised the walls, which he said were 56 miles long, 80 feet thick, and 320 feet high. Although it is generally believed that Herodotus exaggerated the majesty of Babylon, other ancient writers have also noted the magnificence of the wall. So, and we have images of these walls right now. I'll have to share this link with you after, Shelley. But um, the work of Nebuchadnezzar's is spread over 2,000 acres. It formed the most significant archaeological site in the Middle East. And only about 5% of Babylon is believed to have been excavated by archaeologists today. Nebuchadnezzar was considered to be a very successful military leader after his campaigns in Syria and Arabia, and his takeover of Jerusalem in 589 BC, where he was in charge of the destruction of Solomon's temple, also known as the first temple. Okay, And on these images that are on the screen, you can see the walls that are still there today, where they have these images of various creatures like dragons and, and things of that sort. Now, here's something else that's pretty cool. Between the years of 1889 and 1917, the area was extensively excavated by a German archaeology team led by Robert Kalorodoway. Various parts were cleared, including the Ishtar Gate, which was dismantled and re-erected in Berlin, a project which took over 20 years to complete. It can now be viewed in the Pergamum Museum in Germany. After the end of the First World War in 1918, the smaller gate was reconstructed in the Pergamum Museum, the gate is 50 feet high, and the original foundations extended another 40 feet into the ground, 45 feet into the ground. The reconstruction of the Ishtar Gate in the Pergamon Museum is not a complete re replica of the entire gate. The original structure was a double gate with a smaller frontal gate and the larger and more grandiose secondary posterior section. The only section on display in the Pergamum is the smaller in front. So to give you an idea, of how big this gate is in this image, you can see this reconstruction where people are next to it, and that's the small gate. So those of you who are participating online or have the ability to do, you can see how large these gates are, how big this kingdom was, and how powerful this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, was. Okay? So getting back into the first... I'm not going to read that again. That's the same one over and again. So back into da Daniel chapter one, verses eight through 16. Oh, I know why I did that. So on the tail end of verse seven, we see that Daniel and his uh, three counterparts were carried off into Babylon and they were provided for by the king. They were given the king's delicacies. They were, they wanted them to be learned for three years to make sure that they learned both languages. They wanted to make sure that what they took from the other kingdoms was the best of the best, um, which is actually a really smart strategy if you think about it. So, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse likely than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me in danger of my head to the king? This guy has a pretty dang good response. He's afraid of being decapitated because he's been given a direct order from the king for him to give these gentlemen the best of the food that's available. And Daniel's saying he doesn't want the meat, he wants the vegetables. Now, there's a common uh, agreement among scholars, so to speak, that the reason that Daniel was abstaining from meat, especially, I guess, the verbiage that goes on to follow it, was because this was meat that was offered to idols. 
okay? Because we know that they were big into idol worship in that area. So he would have preferred vegetables at this point. At this point. So Daniel then responds to the chief eunuch. He says, and then Daniel says to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulls to eat and water to drink, and then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of thy children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus, Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse, speaking of vegetables in that time. So do you guys see what transpired here? <laughs> Daniel tells the eunuchs, I don't want to eat the meat from the king's table, but in order so that your head isn't on the chopping block, why don't you let us do a 10-day trial? You examine all the other people that are eating the king's meat, and then you look at us four guys and see by your own eyes who looks buffer, so to speak. And um, at the end of this 10-day trial, uh, we can see that, in fact, Daniel and his his three amigos are looking much buffer and, and much better in flesh. So let's move on. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among all them was none found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, and he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So that's giving us a, an overarching uh, premise of how long Daniel was in that type of position. And we're going to see him grow in, in, different, in different areas. So... Let's get into the second chapter. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the kings gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give thee the interpretation. Then the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known to me, if you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an, made an ash heap. However, if you tell me the dream, and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, let the, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. And the king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests. And there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch 
the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill these wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Ariot, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Ariok made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and he made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Therefore, Daniel went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said to, thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has <laughs> demanded the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you were on bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. Okay, I'm going to jump into the dream real quick, but I want to just make note of something. Daniel's given this, this interpretation. He's given this vision. He's given all those things. And who does he give credit to? The Lord. He gives, God. exactly, yes. Every, so I'm hearing lots of right answers. I love it. Okay. Daniel is giving credit to God and he lets Nebuchadnezzar know right then and there, Hey, why can't these other people reveal this matter? But there is a God in heaven. So this is our entrance into, you know, um, Daniel being, uh, almost an evangelist at this point, he's sharing about the God in heaven right now. So let's, let's move on to the dream. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. There may be a little bit of a translation error. The awesome, in, from what I gathered from the commentaries, is that's more of like a terrible, like, oh my gosh, it's awesome, like in a bad way, so to speak. It was just terribly big image, right? This image head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the, the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. This is the dream. Oh, I'm I, sorry. I strengthened that one. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and all the birds of heaven... He has given them into your hand, and he has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. 
But after you shall arise another kingdom, inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks into pieces and shatters everything, the and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. Just as you saw, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break into it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of a mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known, made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. Daniel's about to get a promotion, just letting you know. Spoiler alert. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and the revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So I'm going to do a side, tiny little detour here because we're going to talk about this image, okay? It's an image of gold. It's a gold head, silver body, bronze torso, iron legs, and then iron mixed with clay on the toes. If you look to the screen, you'll see that someone has taken the time to split the, these things up. We know that they represent kingdoms, okay? And we can infer from various sources that, that we know who these kingdoms are. I'm not gonna get into the 10 toes and the iron mixed with clay because we are going to get into another portion in the book of Daniel without being a spoiler alert that may revisit these kingdoms. But I thought it was interesting to note that we already know Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon is the gold head. The breast and arms of silver represent Medo-Persia, uh, which was interesting. And you know what? I'm not even going to get into this because we're going to revisit this later on. But uh, we know that this image represents certain time periods and certain kingdoms. And it'll be exciting for us to look into to see where some of these things fit in today. And I'd really like uh, Mike and Shelly to be a part of it with being able to see the screen. I think it'll it'll help. I so, can't wait. We'll be home next Wednesday. Next Wednesday? <laughs> oh, I was like, oh my gosh, it keeps getting pushed out. Come on. <laughs> okay. Right. Chapter three. Chapter three, and once we're, when we're done with chapter three, that's all I've got for you guys this week. I didn't want to push it. So right after this, and so there's there may be some time period between chapter two and chapter three. It, it, there's Common notes are saying that it's about 20 years, but nonetheless, some time period after chapter two, we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar do something. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, and its width, six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which the King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. 
So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, that you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of of a burning fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So I know you guys might be wondering how big is 60 cubits? So 60 cubits is 90 feet high by six feet, I'm sorry, 90 feet high by nine feet wide. And there's a lot of different conjectures where they say, well, if you had a, an image that tall with that width, all of the proportions would be elongated. Um, a lot of time, what I read is, is that a lot of times what they would do is they'd make this massive base just to make the image itself much taller, much taller. So it could have had a 30 foot base, putting it 90 feet total in the air to meet those dimensions, or the dimensions could be a little bit skewed, just sharing this thing's huge. I also find it interesting that he makes a giant image of gold shortly after having this dream. And we will know that it's after the dream because of the next part. So everyone bows down to worship, right? Every single person does. Therefore, at the time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Oh, King, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid you due regard to you. They do not serve your gods, nor worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time... You hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made? Good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Oh, really? So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said this to the king. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments. And they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, that the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound up in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished 
And he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he said, I see four men, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, the king's counselors were gathered together, and they saw these men whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces. And their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Wow. Every time I hear this story, I think about that song. There is another in the fire standing next to me. So I want you guys to think about something that three people did. All of our world, all of our culture, everything that's going on in our world is pointing in one direction. These gentlemen took a stand and they took a stand up for what they believe in. And that's God, the true king, right? I want you guys to think about how meaningful their choice was. Yes, there was another in the fire with them that was protecting them. But everyone around was who? People of power. It was all the people, the leaders, the you know, all the various rulers, all the various people who were sent over different parts were brought there first to take part in this ceremony, right? I uh, I have some of my notes here on the side. I know not everyone's going to like right now, but I'm going to say them anyways. It they all these people they all bought into the culture, and this was like a celebration, such as the lighting of the Christmas tree in New York, right, or the the drop of the ball in Times Square, or a dedication of new of a new building of some sort with a caveat that those individuals who are there are performing worship towards that great and grandiose image. You have three people that stand out and say it's wrong, and the whole world around them is against them for what they're saying. They're thrown into the fire. God preserves them. And everybody there is witness to it. How much of a meaningful impact do you think that had on that immediate culture not to mention the words that came out of the king's mouth. I mean, I really want you guys to consider that. When what what do we get from the story at the end of at the end of the times that we read these historical accounts of what's going on through you know key people in the Bible? It should strike a chord with us, and we should not be afraid to take a stand for God, to take a stand for Jesus. That's that's my soapbox that I'm on for today, and. I'm going to tell you guys the homework. So I want you guys to read chapters four, five, and six. I want you guys to continue to pray for others. And then the last thing is to give glory to God in trials. We have multitudes of examples where we see something great happening out of what would be perceived a negative impact. Shelly, we talk about this a lot. We talk about this with Mike, with everything that went on with his bladder. Something that was perceived as how, why is this a good thing right now led to the discovery of something and it made a huge deal, right? So we need to give glory in these trials and they're not fun, but that's the message that I'm getting out of the initial part of Daniel. And I think it's a, it's a, it's in the theme across the entire book as a whole. Now I'm going to shut this off here. So Oops, wrong button. If there's anyone that has any questions,